So you look old, I'll lead off to you. Um, you all know Campbell. Campbell. So you all know Campbell. Uh, Campbell holds the role of our biosecurity manager or manager catchment services. Uh, Campbell's been seconded out of that role into project lead for Right Tree, Right Place for potentially up to 18 months, um, uh, depending on how the project rolls. Um, Campbell also, uh, for context, led Council's earlier uh, exploration in the space called uh, Trees on Farms about seven or eight years ago, where Council looked pretty closely at the role of uh, its investment opportunities in, in trees on farms. Right Tree, Right Place is a, uh, a, a variant of that with brings in a whole lot more knowledge and intelligence and, yeah. and kind of expands the, the kaupapa into a much, much broader uh, conversation that we want to start with you. Um, so you've seen the Right Tree, Right Place presentation by the technical team, so you've got all of that background knowledge. Campbell's moving into the space and starting to do the work. We wanted to bring you this paper as an information item uh, to elicit some discussion and conversation, similar to the way you just uh, had that conversation around climate change and uh, your role and your thinking. We really want to get your views and perspectives and thinking on this as we move into it to help shape the work that Campbell's going to do in the future. Uh, to help shape the information and advice that he'll bring back to the committee um, for decision making potentially and then ultimately uh, lead all of that conversation into some serious decision making potentially around the long term plan uh, and you know questions about council's role in this and potential investment so we're really wanting to prepare you for to 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 have those conversations in a manner that you are comfortable with, that you feel like you have all the requisite information uh, to decide whether you are in this space or not. So I'll hand over to Campbell, he'll run you through it, um, and um, please, uh, we want to we want to hear your, your views, perspectives, concerns and elements that you think um, are good, bad and different, and uh, bits that are missing. Okay, <coughs> Campbell. So, um, Thanks for the extremely good intro, Ian. Uh, I guess what I was proposing to do is to actually walk through and get your feedback on, particularly to start with the principles uh, of the paper. I wasn't planning to go through the paper bit by bit, um, but uh, so Chair, if you're comfortable with that, or if there's another process you want to use, but essentially I'd like to go uh, straight to the, uh, your feedback around those guiding principles and then your feedback around some of those key questions that need to be answered over the next, uh, probably in reality, more 12 months than 18 but over the next period of time leading up to a long-term plan. So are you comfortable with that, Mr Chair? Well, it's helpful if you uh, tell me what, how you want the paper to be done before we get to the meeting, but let's make it up as we go. I'm absolutely happy to do that in the future. And Thank I'm you. Sure you'll... OK, so is everybody OK with uh, going through that in order? Normally we would have questions first. Can I, I have a question for Campbell. Uh, let's, well, let's do some questions. Which might lead into that. Um, so, Campbell, um, you know, it's... It's just for the other councillors' um, um, perspective, um, the previous council wanted to put aside um, $100 million for, for reforestation, and there was a resolution to do that. We, there, there wasn't that much thinking about where we'd find the $100 million, but um, nevertheless, uh, there was that. And, uh, subsequently, um, the market jumped ahead of us, and the market, um, and, and you know, we all have mates that are driving this hard because it's such a big business, such a great business proposition at the moment. And, but, and it's also coming from investment offshore, a lot of offshore investment coming in, but it's driven by carbon price. Now carbon price is sitting at 25, but in Europe it's 40, and people are saying it's going to go to 100, or it's going gonna, it's gonna to rise. So there's a tsunami of investment going into uh, reforestation, and it's not all good. Uh, some of it's not uh, um, not good at all. Um, one thing was one uh, stat was seven percent of wire went under um, uh, reforestation last year from um, a lot of offshore investment. And um, I personally have know people that are buying farms there, and um, they're well above the beef um, the sheep and beef market. And so it's happening, and despite the signs that you see all around Wairau, you can't eat trees, nevertheless, 
it's difficult for us to stop. What I want to know is we've done this right tree, right, uh, right place, and we spent 400 grand, and it's excellent. I have read it, <coughs> thought it's really good. How can we use that um, uh, technology or intellectual property to influence, especially the onshore um, um, operators, but um, especially the offshore operators who don't have any understanding of this? And I discussed this with uh, Rick a couple of days ago. Um, I'd say the chairman of the board of the Enzo's investment companies have no perception of what's going on. It's just their underlings that are sitting in front of computers going, yeah, well, let's just do this. It's going to cost us 20 million. Bang, we're in. How can we influence those people and how can we influence the aggressive uh, players who are onshore as well with this? Question. <laughs> so, so I think, so, I think um, so my comment to that would be literally uh, that's the essence or one of the key questions of the essence which we need to establish over the next probably 12 months in terms of what is council's role in any additional investment in afforestation um, and the reality is that it's a reasonably complex picture uh, it's a really significant challenge we're facing in terms of having any real impact on the, the potential uh, mismatch between, in some cases, land use and the impact uh, of land use on water quality, particularly sediment and erosion. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not going to try and give you an answer to that right now, just to say that actually that is part of what we need to establish over the next 12 months. But I would say, even though only, I've only just been in this in the last four weeks, uh, it's becoming really, <coughs> some of the key components of this are starting to become clearer to me. Uh, and as that develops, I'll bring those to you uh, over time. But, but before getting to that part of the picture, for me, uh, actually there are some fundamental principles we need to establish. Uh, and those things really will guide me over the next 12 months to uh, be clear on what my focus and mandate is from you uh, as to where we might go. So I apologise if that was a bit equivocal. No, good, I, just, I just want to pick up on Rex's question and flick it back to you in a different manner, which I think is the key question there. What leadership role does the council wish to play in this? Now, uh, uh, the style of leadership wish to play. Now, Rex is putting the point that uh, people, independent players, are going to do their own thing. And, and so he's saying, how do we influence that? But we have other things we want to do, which is about uh, uh, reforestation for sequestration of carbon to meet our carbon neutrality goals. We want reforestation to protect the hillsides to stop that. So, in a mix this mix, what is going to be our leadership role? How are we going to project ourselves and influence these other players? That's what I think is a, the key thing. Yeah, we've got the principles. But what is our leadership role going to be in it? That's a question. Can I comment on that? Because actually, in the end... I'd like you to answer at, it, actually. If you look at some of the principles, <laughs> the answer is actually starting in some of the principles. So firstly, there's a principle around, uh, do you want to take a leadership role and recognise uh, ecosystem services as part of the future investment context of this particular investment if you decide to make one over the next 12 months? So there's a leadership role around that. There's a leadership role around... Uh, do you want to uh, see integrated on farm forestry or whole farm conversions and the implications of that? Do you see a leadership role in that context? So I guess the answer to your question is uh, starting with some of these principles and how you guide me on those. Anyway? Um, kia ora Campbell. Um, so, so what I thought are some key uh, principles to consider when doing your due diligence is, um, you know, it's called the right tree right place for the right purpose. So I just want to focus on the purpose part. And I think some key principles to consider and what I'm interested in um, knowing more about with the due diligence is the biodiversity enhancement, um, erosion implications on waterways, what they will look like, and also um, offsetting our regional carbon footprint. So those are some of the guiding principles I think I would like, I'm considering when looking at any project um, and that goes, you know, for for this project. So that's what will drive me. Those are the key principles to this, as well as obviously the financial gains aspect. But the right purpose is sits with our environmental um, purpose within this project. Chair, I, I I think those are probably the three big headline areas that would sit under the ecosystem service 
benefit. So perhaps if we break down what, what, <coughs> what within that principle are the, the, the focus areas, the biodiversity and the fresh water as well as the, the, the carbon uh, offsetting. I mean, they are three really big services that trees provide. So, yeah, I think in terms of your 10.2, Campbell, there's the opportunity to just break that down again for the next level. Can I just add to what Henny Wise said? Is, <coughs> with that, I think it's back to, I think we were at with the Ahariri history, is we need sort of a vision. What is the picture? What does the end point look like? And how do those th three things meet, feed into that? And I thought the uh, idea of uh, kahutia, the recloaking of the land, was a wonderful image. <clears throat> it said it you know, really quickly to me what we were trying to do. And so I think we need, a, 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 as part of this, we need what is the, when we've done all of these things, protected the environment, protected biodiversity, done those, what does it actually look like? So we need to have a statement of that. So the end objective, and these are the three principles that drive that. Yeah. So, so, Chair, look, it was a really useful place to start around kind of what space do you want to play, uh, what place do you want to play in here and the, the, the role of the council in the leadership sense. Um, for me, one of the key things that I think this council can play a leadership role in is ultimately the decisions around what happens on land is uh, the decision of the landowner. So he or she will make decisions, unless you're regulating, regulating them, of course, but he or she will make decisions about what they will do, where and when. Part of this exercise is creating the tools and the right information to take into those farm systems for farmers to build an integrated view of the farm platform and understand the role of trees in, the, in an integrated farm landscape, not only from a biodiversity biosecurity, ecosystem services, water quality perspective, but also from a profitability perspective because they're there running a business to make money. So the idea is that we will empower them with knowledge to understand the options for uh, trees in an integrated sense in the farm landscape and then support them in making those uh, visions for their property real. Whether council's an investor directly, whether you're a partner with others in that, or whether you're simply pointing them to others where there's no market failure uh, who are already doing that and you say go and work with them. And then the other part of it which I think is really valid and worthy of some consideration is are you going to try and influence the international market and can you influence the international market? So if a, if a property is sold wholesale, uh, can you convince a, a London based investor not to put money into radiator and wholesale plant of the property, uh, will, would they engage in something more holistic? That's, a, that's quite a big question and quite a big area to, to explore. Um, not to say that it's not somewhere you could go, but those are the very sorts of things we would like you to give us your views on. Would you like to be in there? Would you like to be in here? Would you like to be in all of those places? And then that'll help Campbell shape his thinking. If, if we are seeing a role for us to influence the international investment community, well, what we'll bring back to you will be quite different than just, you know, something narrowly focused on perhaps um, something very regionally based. Obviously, a lot more complexity, but not, not impossible. On that question, <coughs> I know that Rex has had uh, a lot of thought about this and alluded to it before. So, would you like to comment, Rex, on the yeah, I, influencing I, the international investors? I personally investors? think um, you can influence the international investment community. You can't influence their underlings the guys that they are charged sitting in front of the computers. You can't, because they're, they're charged to make as much money. But the people who own those companies, the, the chairman of the board, he has a much broader, he'll have a much broader view of, of doing good things. And you generally get that at, those, at the level um, that they'll have a, so they could influence their people. Somehow, we've got to get to the people that own these investment companies, because we're running out of time here. You know, if we've lost 7% and you lose 10% um, um, next year, we've got really good uh, beef farms in Central Hawke's Bay, uh, uh, sheep and beef farms going in under. We've got really good farms in Wairau going under. It's not just rugged hill country going under. So, and, and it is actually a threat to our economy that is happening here. And we haven't got much time to muck around. So we've got to find out who's doing this and touch them at the highest level. That's my view. 
so that we can say, hey you guys, don't destroy, nobody wants to destroy small communities. Well, generally, investors don't. But the guys that they're charged to do it, they don't care less, they just charge to buy a farm and get on with it. So I do think at that level we really got to give some thought how we would do that, how we would touch the people that are making those investments and say, you know, can you put that gully in, can you do this? Because we're talking big farms here going under, under the trees. Craig? Mm, thank you, Mr Chair. Yeah, I'm very sympathetic to that. I've, I've seen, um, seen the same just out where I live and I'm very aware of some farms. But I've just got a f few questions. Can you just tell me a bit more about the 100 million that Re uh, Councillor, um, Councillor Graham um, alluded to? Is 100 million in the plan? Uh, no. So in the consultation document of yep. the last long-term plan, Council signalled an intention to <coughs> contemplate investing up to $100 million in regional uh, afforestation. Okay. Uh, and that, that kicked off this body of work, which was the right tree, right place that Hbrook has undertaken with funding from central government to look at the size of that opportunity, what would an execution pathway look like. That's given us, I guess, the size of the prize and some of the issues uh, that, that arise for council around going down that path. And that's now uh, in Campbell's hands to then translate that into a series of policy options for you for the next long-term plan. Okay, so the precursor there is, so we're, you've begun your contemplation yep. of that, fair enough, um, but there's other discussions this afternoon, because at the end of the day this is committing the council to some serious, up to 100 mil, um, contemplation accepted and all those things. So it, wherever we end up, it has to be seen in the context of what it means for the council's balance sheet from the very top level down, Absolutely. and the risks that this council <coughs> has exp um, exposure to certain sectors for a start. Um, you, Ian, you mentioned the term market failure before. What markets failed? What sorry, do you mean by that? No, sorry. What, what I was suggesting is that, uh, <coughs> to, to um, Councillor Graham's point, there's a lot of people active in um, forestry at the moment. We don't want an occup We do not want to occupy a space where there is no market failure. So if there are people operating in the right way, for example, radiata, well, we don't need to be actively pursuing a radiata market. Um, we would simply be looking for the opportunities to fill the gaps where others uh, aren't operating and don't exist. And, and back to that point of building the toolbox, at the moment if you're a landowner you don't really have a lot of options from a commercial forestry perspective. It's kind of radiator or nothing at the moment. If the right tree, right place proposition opens an opportunity for a range of other species with a range of other benefits. Not only from a profitability perspective, but also from a farm resilience, etc., etc. So, is that a space that you might want to occupy? Because currently, there's no real active market for that. There's nobody active in that space. So maybe you go, we don't want to be in the radiata game, but we do want to be in drywood eucalypts or manuka or something else. Yeah, I appreciate <coughs> that. And we had a similar discussion when those guys presented, but mm. I, I just, market failure to some is market success to others. Sure. So, I don't yeah. know, it's quite a subjective term. Um, just say he's a currency trader. I'm, I'm not <laughs> an economist. That's exactly the right thing. Yeah, not, not currency, but, but for every one of these, there's a loser. But, but, but also, um, Councillor Graham, you know, talked about, um, you know, those trying to influence those that are essentially at the end of the food chain, buying up farms and putting them in pines, etc. Okay, but actually, aren't the incentives before that? Because those people are just responding to incentives. Some reports given them they've got to get a yield return. Blah blah blah. Um, the, the, those incentives are actually essentially coming from central government at the moment, and so which, which is and you know as you pointed out earlier the carbon price etc. Some people just call it the <coughs> carbon farming, as opposed to offsetting whatever they might be. So uh, if we do choose to influ influence, um, my suggestion would be as you go back to where the incentives are coming from, because those incentives are having consequences. I'm sure unintended across our area, our region. And I don't think um, any of us particularly like these consequences at the moment. We all agree hill country erosion and all that, but some of the decent plains and farms, it's just hard. Um, but I carry that at that with um, wherever the discussion goes, uh, just the exposure that the council has to wood. Um, if you think of it like that, it is massive. Um, one other point 
the Right Tree Right Place report, I can't quite remember, but I don't think, nor this report, incorporates a stock take of, actually, what's there now? You know, actually everyone knows Pampax um, trees, etc. But there are a lot of smaller plantings, may or may not be ETS compliant, but they still um, do their job as far as greenhouse gases are concerned, and most of them are actually, many are natives across many farms. That can be, as I alluded to the other day, QE2 blocks um, all over the place, and they seem small, but if you aggregate them up. Right. Hawke's Bay has a very good story to tell as far as coverage concerned, or at least a good starting point, in addition to perhaps contemplating further investment by this organisation potentially in either incentivising or actually purchasing and investing into planting more trees. So we just have that, please. Yeah, right, let's have us over here, over in this corner here, Mark. Thank you. Um, I watched and uh, I had to miss the presentation, so the last two evenings I've watched it. And I just want to congratulate all of you for the uh, insightful questioning of the excellent presenters of that report. I learned a great deal from it. Um, I've taken some, some notes of what I've, I think the nine key learnings I got out of that. I want to talk about one of them in a minute. Um, just to answer your question, Rex, the carbon price under the uh, Emissions Trading Act, Emissions Trading Scheme reforms, is going to range between $35 and $50. So they're going to increase it the bottom to $35. Oh, bang. And then cap at $50, in other words, release more units into the market if it gets above $50. But the Productivity Commission report on a low uh, emissions economy has determined through various modelling scenarios that to engineer the one the 2.8 million hectares of land uh, transition we need to be carbon zero would need a carbon price of up to $250 a tonne. So um, whether that's market failure or not, that's the, the settings are changing and they are important. Dealing with what this council can do, uh, there is a, a big conversation about our role uh, as in terms of our investment portfolio do we invest through managed funds and shares, or do we invest in triple bottom line stuff in the economy that does you know, good things, like uh, every dollar invested in forestry has $1.5 of returns, according to that report? But the, the standout I got from the presentation, you used the words yourselves, James, uh, the number one learning is about feet on the ground. And I would have thought this council's likely most useful role, other than any direct investment in forestry, would be as a facilitator uh, of brokering uh, between farmer and expertise, of enabling them to make their own decisions, to break their farm down into the units, uh, and to work out what is going to keep their, um, their income, editor, whatever it is, the uh, you know, uh, editor, um, in, in, the, in the right place. And so I think it's that uh, helping farmers get there themselves. And you made the comment, Jeriff, you know, the last thing we want to do is say, I'm the government, I'm here to help. Um, but if you can help farmers make those decisions themselves and facilitate that, that's probably, in a capital sense, where we're likely to get the biggest bang for our buck in terms of achieving. These are absolutely overwhelming uh, numbers, 250,000 hectares, right, uh, the ESC is only going to tackle 20,000 hectares and that's 35 million and we're borrowing it. Um, so I, I have an idea to get to the question, the role of the council, how do we draw the link between the expertise that's needed, how do we reveal these case studies that uh, ha have shown the success of this so that our communities who own all of this land are going to do it themselves. Um, and, 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 and the light bulb's going to go on. And I actually see a role for HBRIC in that, um, and in terms of having some of that expertise, or of, in the same way we partner, we contract to Works, uh, we contract to HBRIC to provide that expertise to, to other people. Um, we partner with, or MOU with EIT or Sky on, or whoever it is. Uh, so it's that facilitating enabling the landowners to get there themselves is probably where I see our role <coughs> in a capital sense is um, most efficient. At a personal level, I'd like to us to go and spend that 100 million that's sitting there in the port, port shares 
and just get on with it. Uh, but I don't think that that's uh, that's probably going to fly. So there you go. That's right. Neil. Uh, I think um, my my comments probably follow on a little from from Martin's, but um, I do want to go firstly to 10.7. Um, and um, the, the second line in 10.7 says blanket forestry across whole farms is not an outcome sought by the project. Um, I think that's um, potentially too simplistic um, when we've got a classic, very successful example at Waihapua already where we have done just that and there are clearly um, uh, candidates that we ought to be thinking about that anyway. Um, anyone driving to Mahia um, past Wairo and looking up at the um, hard hill country to the left, uh, which is virtually white, exposed, having lost all its uh, soil, uh, we, we, we ought to be contemplating blanket coverage of that land uh, somewhere or another. And it takes me to Martin has just left off um, leveraging of partnerships. Um, I, I think um, the, the um, paper and the reference to 250,000 hectares um, makes the case overwhelming. Um, I wonder, in fact, whether it would be much more strategic than um, right tree, right place over 250 hectares. I think it's, it's, it's far too expansive as to what's what's practical um, and in fact what is our role in that the market the market as we've already re alluded to will certainly cover um, uh, a broad swath of land that is much more amenable to production forestry but what we're most concerned about is the the most exposed erodible land and what are the strategies that that um, that we uh, are seeing to be uh, important for that for that for that land. Um, so I wonder, in the light of the events that have overtaken us by way of um, investments that are going to take place as we speak, that in fact we do narrow down the right tree, right place uh, to um, an erodible land strategy, that we, we contemplate uh, a much more focused strategy, um, and leveraging those those partnerships and looking at a number of options that uh, we might be able to use. One is to purchase, as we have in the past, a block of land and plant it up. And I think we contemplated that um, um, in the early days of the 100 million. Uh, but then look at, if you like, influencing stroke, incentivising block planting on the most erodible land, working with those landowners to, to actually essentially permanently retire um, uh, the identified land. Um, any thoughts from James, Ian? And I was just about to make the observation that the, the work that we've had done over the last 18 months uh, within the project by the consortium that, 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 that has um, presented to you in December provides uh, the very tools that now enable Campbell to then go to that much more targeted approach. So we've now got, uh, we've now got fine scale mapping that we can put alongside our Sidnet modelling. We've got our LiDAR fly, flights uh, due to start uh, in, the, in the next few weeks. Very high resolution topographic, topographical data. So all that comes together to enable us to be much more targeted than say, let's just try and tackle 250,000 hectares, which you rightly note is an audacious uh, uh, undertaking. So. Um, the work that I think we would anticipate coming forward over the next 12 months is getting really precise about where the intervention point is. But the thing we've been quite cautious around, and that's why there is the comment around blanket forestry, because um, I wouldn't <coughs> agree with you that there are farms, parcels of land that, that do need blanket afforestation. There's just a very high level of community anxiety around that. And the fact that the Regional Council has a broader brand imperative around its interface with farmers and there's a whole bunch of things we need to do with farmers from pest control right through to our water reforms etc and our ability to be a trusted advisor and welcome onto rural properties is, is something we need to carefully guard 
And so what we need to delicately work through here is, is whether or not the regional council risks its brand in any way by becoming associated with what is seen as the sort of the, the ending of rural communities through blanket afforestation, etc. So we're just yeah. delicately walking that path. I, I totally yeah. appreciate the optics. Just, just, okay. just to, so I just want to come back to try to get ourselves back uh, here. I just want to come back to the point that was raised uh, about the hundred million and to answer Craig's point. <clears throat> We had a discussion and we were trying to figure out how we could you know, make progress this. And it was a, a formal discussion <clears throat> in which we went about what is the size that we think we need to do to be able to influence this to a degree. <clears throat> and at the end it was a discussion where we came to a figure, we thought if we were going to have achieve something that was worthy in this area, we are going to look at an investment of up to 100 million. <clears throat> we didn't exactly identify where the money was going to come from, but if we were going to affect erosion, climate change, that we needed to be in that, in that order of magnitude. Anything less than that was never going to do it. So we set that as the parameter, and we didn't actually have a plan, particularly, of how to go forward to it. Because to develop the plan would take us 10 years. So this is a bit of a set out the scope of it, say what the order of magnitude is, and then work our way through it. <coughs> so subsequent to that, Rex has identified that other players have come into this, into this area are looking for investment for different reasons. So it's altered where we were when we first figured about the 100 million. So we're, but it was always going to be an adaptive plan. You know, I think we've just got to keep that as in our mind. But can I just come back to the other point about it? Is that, is that uh, you, you make the point about um, price signals and things doing it at a lower level. It, I don't think that's inconsistent with the point that Rex is making about influencing international people. We need to have a vision of what we want for Hawke's Bay, we need to have the key drivers <coughs> on that, and then the flexibility to go and interface with everybody else who comes in this area to uh, change their views to fit with what our vision is, what we want to achieve. Without that, we're not going to be able to do it. So I want to keep the flexibility, I want to keep the scope of the ambit of it, uh, be adaptive, <coughs> and have a, a vision about what it is, and so that we can then continue to, to influence Rex. Um, yeah, Chair, that, that is exactly right. I guess um, <coughs> what's worried me from the, uh, very, from the over the last year, and worries me a lot more, just what Martin's um, told me, and I wasn't up to speed. If carbon price goes to thirty-five dollars, we are going to see this thing go crazy, and we can't keep up with the market. The market always drives in front of us, and um, it started driving in front of us two years ago uh, after we did the. Uh, after we had that conversation about 100 million, and we stepped back and said, market's going to do this. Somehow, we, um, we have got to start influencing the market, um, at least telling them our story, because um, we'll change some, and the more ruthless ones will just say, to hell with you, I'm just going ahead, because we're going to see small communities deficit. Uh, I don't think Central Hawke's Bay uh, is out of this loop, but certainly Wairau. Just to go back to your point, though, um, Craig, is this... Um, while we do need <coughs> a large amount does, do need to be um, f go back and reforestation, because the amount of silt, because we have um, you know we have deforested at such a rate uh, that it goes into the wild or river and goes in, into our ocean is decimating our fisheries, destroying the river, the river, the silt in the river. So we do have an urgency in wild or in the wild or catchment, which is a bit different from the rest of the catchment, but. These international investors and local investors, they don't care. They'll just buy farms um, anywhere and plant them up. And it's out of control now, let alone the carbon price goes up. We need to react quite quickly and say, hey, we have a vision, take it on the chairs, um, for, we have a vision and we want you to share our vision <coughs> with us. Because they're just going to come. I appreciate that. Can't say it, but I think you just answered it because I'm with you on most of what you said. Other than they don't care, so we can't influence that. I think but they the don't. Can, they don't know. Well, yeah, sorry, you just said they don't care because they're just chasing the return. Yes, but I think I'm saying at the higher level, I think they will care. We haven't told them our story. Yeah, and we should, and we should. You're absolutely right there. But bangs for bucks, you, you know, um, they're all pricing 100 acres, 100 hectares at. at $35.50 a hectare, oh, sorry, a tonne, so be it, <coughs> wherever that goes, and the government is sending all sorts of signals in that direction, so, so okay. We're actually, that's, this has an upside for us as well with our, our timber assets, um, just quietly. But it, again, the, 
there's all these investors from all over the world looking here and blind to beautiful Hawke's Bay, blind to New Zealand, just as a nice return yeah. to be brutal. But we also have um, an opportunity to speak with central government and perhaps lead some of the discussion in our identification of some of the decent plains lands, et cetera, et cetera. So well, okay. that's a government policy driving all these you know, incentives, the billion trees and all that, okay. But actually, can we be part of some criteria to throttle that down to achieve at least the erosion type outcomes we're talking about and not decimate? Because we've seen that in these examples across we, the country. We've just, we've just transferred this tra Travis this subject for the third time. <coughs> but I just think this is the issue here is there's actually no disagreement. No, I agree with what he said. Do you agree with him? He agrees with him. But what we need for our own purposes, we need a clear vision of what it is we want to do. We've got the clear principles, and we also need to make a make a decision that we are going to uh, provide leadership on this area and seek to influence all the parties who are engaged in this, whether it be central government or overseas investors come here <coughs> to to a, a, a view of what is as and, and we think that we will get people to agree with that. But we need to have the vision to then seek to influence. Okay, so I'm sorry, Mr. Well, in that case, then, there, to me, there is a principle missing then. Which is that? Which is we, this gets stress tested against the council's tyre balance sheet and risk exposure, any consideration of investing capital into trees. Doesn't mean we do or we don't, but we have all these other investments related to trees. Um, so we're very, very exposed, and it's for another committee. I, I fully appreciate that. But that's another principle that's missing. So this cannot be looked at in isolation of say, a right tree, right place, um, and the environmental criteria, which is very, very valid. At one stage, we need to reference, actually, what does this mean as far as the council's exposure to this, if we're choosing mm -hmm. to invest further risk, further capital <coughs> in trees. But isn't that 12.6 in the paper? No, well, not that how I interpret 12.6. I was looking at uh, most the appropriate series. Yeah, but just to go in there, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it hasn't uh, quite... It hasn't quite put it in the context. That assumes we're doing it. It does, but again, it's the appropriate. You say, well, right. is this appropriate or not appropriate? Yeah, yeah if that can be added probably, to probably, then I'm coming Probably 12.2 and 12.3 really is, you know, how does it align with our other, yes, our yes. other investments, etc. And it was certainly um, the intent. Yes, but I think it's really important in terms of the okay. yeah. so point made, acknowledged, fair enough. Yep, we're, 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 all, we're, we're all agree with that. We're not going to get ourselves... Chair, can I ask James, though, because um, I agree influencing government. You, you're on this national committee. Is there a chance given that current price is going here, that we can influence government to say, we don't want our rolling hills, we don't want our flats. End of last year, our, our formal position as a council, alongside every other council in New Zealand, uh, to central government, was to adopt the recommendations of the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment, which was to ring fence uh, carbon sequestration benefits under the Emissions Trading Scheme to the agricultural sector, and the wider economy's uh, greenhouse gas emissions not to be uh, offset through afforestation. So he had a particular view that farming should be able to offset on farm, but that the rest of the economy should have to deal with their emissions and not be able to offset by planting trees. So we supported that position formally with government. We lobbied around it um, in the event central government has uh, uh, not agreed with that view and they're boxing on with the, with the current ETS framework. So we can continue to, and I, I think we will, um, as local government, continue to advocate around this. And I know Mayor Little has been very active in Wellington with ministers around the concerns that Wairau District has uh, in particular. Uh, and, and certainly in my work with um, central government officials, this issue is being talked about uh, a great deal. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bit of a disconnect, I would say, within government between to Uruvaku, which is forestry New Zealand, the forestry minister's view, which is about being reasonably targeted and careful about where trees go, and then the climate change ministers, which are all about keeping New Zealand's uh, abatement cost for meeting our international obligations and meeting our, our targets <coughs> as low as possible, and that means having as many offsetting opportunities as possible, and that's the tension central government is uh, can, can I ask the question you asked him? Can I say to you, the answer to this I thought I gave to you some time ago, <clears throat> the answer actually is relatively simple. Is that a lot of these overseas companies come here to buy and have to go through the Overseas Investment Office, the OIO. That is the point at which we target. Now, we can't go to the OIO and say, this is what we want here, and therefore influence their decisions. 
And, and if we're going to influence their decisions, we need to have a clear vision put out there. What is the purpose for it? And say any investments that are made into farming should comply with the regional council's vision. Mm. So we need to get we need to get our house in order first before we go and do things. Now I think we can be quite influential on that, but we have to get our house in order first, we, which we, is a clear vision. The principles articulated, and then agree that we're going to provide leadership, on this, which is to go out and do the argument, whether it be through the OIO, through the chairman of boards, through the investors, whoever it is. But we have to have it very clear what we're going to do. Unfortunately, Mr. Chair, they exempted um, forest reinvestment from that uh, OIO, At the moment, the it's exempted process. Yeah, I know, but we we so we can still advocate. I agree. We, but a lot of it's been done. Now, I agree, but see, if we go with a vision about what we want to do, is we want to say to people, for example, what our, loosely what our view was, you want to plant trees, plant them on these steep hills here, but leave the flats. The flats might not be sufficient to make the farm economical, so there might be a process whereby we buy two, three, four farms, or two, three, four farms are bought, the, the, uh, uh, the steep erodible hills are cut out, and leaving all the flats in one or two units to make it a viable unit. So aggregation to then uh, make the, the farms viable, well, keeping them. So we might be able to get them to say, well, if you want to invest so many hectares, this is how you do it. And the overseas investor might all right, I've got to buy five farms and leave two, and leave the steep, whatever it is. Well, if we don't have a view about that, we can't influence people. I agree. I hope they, they do, but they just have no obligation because it's the benefit. But if, if we have a plan, we can argue for it. We don't have a plan. I agree with that. Jim? Yep. Um, so, uh, in my previous studies in agricultural civil engineering in Holland, we actually have a model where actually every square metre is actually determined what actually can do and not do on it. So, through the tank, tank, uh, tank uh, change plan, we, uh, we looked at um, maybe anything 15 degrees uh, um, and steeper only to be used for forestation. Um, so, is there a way that we actually pl make, can make a plan change yep. and, and change so that we actually can say that, and, and we do the same with with, um, with uh, valuable soils around Kukui, you know. Now we actually have got them protected and we actually can't get onto them anymore but, and they are left for, for horticulture or agriculture production over there. Um, I always liked New Zealand because it was free, you could do whatever you wanted. But we're now getting to this stage, because we're saying four and a half million people, all of a sudden an investor comes in who maybe has got a million mum and pup investors, all of a sudden there's not five and a half million people anymore on our, on our piece of land, it's actually five and a half million people. You're because right. they actually have got the money and they invest. They may not be physically here, but they're having an impact. And so they are actually here. So maybe that's an avenue. because. If we actually took, uh, talking about recloaking the bay, the recloaking is going to happen. All we need to do, and I don't like a, a black and white um, uh, dog to, bar to bark, we maybe go to a more fawn coloured, uh, bigger bark, and we actually push them through regulation in a certain direction, and we actually decide where that area is. That's one way of looking at it. And I thought that, that's what we are here as regulators. Can I, can I speak to that, Mr. Chair? Sure. I was just. Um, entertaining that idea myself uh, in the discussion in terms of Rex's comment about getting ahead of the market. The one tool we do have is regulation. Hypothetically speaking, under the Resource Management Act, you could um, introduce an interim rule that said until we've got um, the finer details of right tree, right place sorted out, you're not doing pine trees on land less than 15 degrees slope. Um, the problem with that would probably be, uh, uh, other than the obvious um, uh, reaction of some sectors of the community who, who might think that's actually a bad idea, uh, would be the NES on forestry which flips that and actually says uh, you're permitted on flat land to do forestry and less so you need a consent on the orange and the red land that's steep. And I'm not entirely clear on to what extent uh, local authorities can be more stringent than an NES on forestry. But that is the tool. I, I would be very careful about any conversation we have uh, as to you know, expressing a serious intention in that regard. But that is the tool. The one thing that we have got as a local authority that could force central government's hand 
uh, would be to say, we're worried about our farmers and white oil, we're worried about that, your policy, we're worried about where the carbon price is, is sending that, and until that's sorted out, this is what we're doing. Could we do that, James? But, Chair, this has been raised with central government, and ministers have asked for advice on this as well in relation to using a national environmental standard, including the one which is currently under development to protect highly productive soils. Uh, it is really problematic. Uh, and it's problematic because uh, actually some of the flat land uh, is quite good for growing trees on, and you'd note that New Zealand's largest pine forest is actually on almost dead flat land in the central North Island. Uh, so it would be a very, very big regulatory taking uh, from private property owners' uh, current right to plant, plant trees on, on flat land, uh, and it will be fought um, every step of the way by the forestry industry because of the consequences for them. So my advice to you would be that we will be tied up for quite some time in litigation around this, and uh, we might not get the, the outcome we want, given we'd have to justify it based on environmental effects. So that's something we can continue to talk to central government about and provide you with some more formal advice on further down the track, but um, this is not easy territory. Mr. Just, just, I just want something, just so that things coming on now. Campbell, you came here with a paper to get some answers. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I feel that we've given you different answers than what you were looking for, uh, for questions you haven't asked, but... Uh, given that we've got the conversation so far, is there much else that you think we need to do from where this paper's at now? So I think firstly that's really useful actually, even though it's a wide ranging discussion, so it was useful for me and I've got a number of points I've taken out of that. I guess one of the key questions is, in terms of the, uh, the key questions, are there any there that you think are, are not appropriate to help guide things or to, to answer effectively over the next 12 or 18 months? Is there anything missing out of those that you would rather I focus on as well? Neil, you're waving at me. Yes, I am, indeed. Um, well, well, thanks for that opportunity. <laughs> um, I, I, <clears throat> my view is that, um, the, the, that the principles ought to be significantly focused on the Council's core business and purpose, uh, which essentially is to... Uh, is, is sedimentation and, and a rateable country. So I, th I think that ought to be the overriding principle that we consider. Um, I appreciate at 10.7 the uh, optics of, uh, of, of um, blanket forestry cover, but I think if you're adopting it as a principle, saying that we're not going to do it when in fact potentially that is a significant strategy um, despite the optics, I, I think we ought to not, at least not say that <laughs> and go further and say we may actually use that as a strategic uh, option on, on the identified land. Again, it tends in my mind to focus where we ought to be focused and that is on uh, the problem. Can, can, I just, can, I just, can I just respond to you, just to come back to your point here? Can I just summarise what I think we've got to? Firstly, I think we, if I'm not mistaken, I think we all accept uh, well, it was accepted that the regional council has to provide leadership in this area and 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 exert influence where we can. Uh, that we want to have out of this, we want to have a clear vision of what the end of this is going to look like. Kahi here, rear cloaking the land. We're driven by three underlying principles: sequestration of carbon, erosion, biodiversity, environment. Those are the key principles. To get under that. Yeah. Then falling down below that, we are looking to collaborate, cooperate, influence, whatever it is. And we're prepared to put money in <clears throat> as long as it's consistent with what our current council's balance sheet is and the risk is, et cetera, et cetera. But we prefer others to do it for ourselves, for ourselves. But we will do it. That's where we've got to, I think. I agree, Mr Chair, other than it's still presumptive. I mean, you, you summing up with, yes, except right that last point, that we will do it. So if you say something like, we will do it, then that just knocks out all the everything else before that, because regardless of what the answer is, we will do it. So, I mean, if, if we can just add into the principles, you don't have to do it for the next paper or whatever, just note that, um, just take away that presumptive element to it and continue to contemplate in pa contemplation, perhaps, because yep. at the end of the day, that casts a shadow over other activities of the okay. council. So to, 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 just to that point, uh, just remind councillors that uh, council 
can't decide it's going to do something until it has undertaken consultation anyway, and you don't want to be predetermined going into that consultation. Okay. So. Let's take the just do it. Let's take that out. We won the previous conversation before we're having. Let's get on with this and not muck around. So we're now going to muck around before we get on with it. But it's, uh, <laughs> inconsistency is the, <coughs> is the key element of, of a committee. So have I, have I got that reasonably summed So if that, you can come back and recast this paper, as I presume that's what you would do. Yep, absolutely. I'll take on board the feedback. and Recast yep. this paper and bring it back to a subsequent meeting of the Environment Committee and we'll then refine it from there. Just, just Martin. one last point in response to um, Councillor Curtin's last comment. I, I actually think it's really important to keep that last sentence at 10.7 personally. Uh, I think the optics uh, reflect uh, well, certainly my intent that we're not out there to uh, nail the farming sector, quite the opposite. Um, each farm's going to have its own um, best management and overall uh, you know, land response. Can I just make that point that I would like to see that remain and just perhaps a more express reference uh, alongside the more direct reference to the specific ecosystem benefits of biodiversity, waterways and offsetting CO2 to a potential advisory broker, you know, that, that word advisory service um, would, I think that's more expressly be reflected in perhaps partnerships and leverage it. Okay, taking board you've got a directive to take it out, a directive to keep it in. Can I comment briefly as clarification? <laughs> so, so Chair, can I comment briefly for clarification? Okay. So perhaps that actually that last sentence could be better worded. Ultimately, there might be the need in some places to uh, put I'm suggesting to trees you. across whole farms, but uh, I don't think um, stating that as our only intention at this stage across whatever the hectares of hundreds of thousands happens to be is our guiding principle. But it should be probably a solution for part of the picture. Okay, so can I suggest a resolution for this that the uh, um, Environment Group receives and considers the re report and uh, um, looks forward to a revised report coming back to a subsequent meeting. All right? Someone like to move that? I'll move. Henny Y. Uh, Jeff? Thank you. Jeff, you like to speak? Anybody else speak? Well, just a point of clarification, Mr. Chair. On the resolution? Yes. Yes? Uh, uh, is it intended that the report be, the, the next version of the report is reported to council or to committee? To the committee. So it's not this, is, we're not expecting this to be done for report to the next council meeting. No, it comes back to this committee. We, these reports come to the committee, the committee considers them, then put, puts them up to the council with its recommendation. Standard proceed there. All right, any other speakers? Can I just make a comment? Is sure. This to me is adaptation. Yep. And we should not forget that. And so if we have a chance of actually speaking about it, um, because this is something that is already happening, yep. um, because it's not just erosion, it's also about in the water space as well, to keep more water in the land, land, landscape, is done by trees, uh, generally not by people, uh, so it's got many bene benefits. So in future, when we have these emergencies, when water, look what happened in, in Southland right now, um, this is actually adaptation that we're actually working on. I just want to make a comment. Exactly right. All right, all those in favour will say aye. 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 Up we go. Kerry. Item 10, that's no, right, 9. Protonal Plains Control Scheme Service Review. Chris. Thank you. So uh, I'd just like to introduce. Thank you, Campbell. Mm -hmm. On the new, uh, uh, new space. <laughs> Gone from birds to trees. Still relevant. <laughs> Excellent. So thank you, Chair. So I just wanted to introduce Martina Groves. Uh, Martina is our manager, regional projects. So when I first came into the group manager role about 15 months ago, we did do a bit of a restructure that put a focus on our capital delivery. So uh, Martina heads up the team whose sole purpose is to deliver our, our capital projects and to work on the framework of how we deliver um, our capital, so it's improving, delivering capital <coughs> to time and, uh, and to, to budget. Um, I also just wanted to point out before Martina uh, gets into the presentation that there is a, an error in the, in the paper. Uh, we talk about consultation for this project occurring <coughs> in 2015. Uh, that particular consultation actually occurred in 2012. 
Um, so I just wanted to make sure everyone um, was aware of, of that error. Yeah. So really, um, had an opportunity to, to read the paper. Martina will do a, a presentation uh, that covers similar aspects. Um, and we look, we look forward to, uh, to your questions. Thank you. Ma uh, Martina, over to you. I'll just help Martina load it up. Um, so there's two. We get Jaffa's ice cream on the TV show. Yeah. So before I start, I just would like to um, kind of show you what we just recently, actually just this week, um, undertaking in our, our asset group. Um, it's very new, even in, in New Zealand. It's a new um, geophysic testing of the stock bank. So basically, what you do is that you find out the uh, build-up or the um, what is under the stock bank is the what soil, what condition, how compact it. Because before, um, what we have to do, we actually have to physically go and um, either do a physical testing, the bore, and that's not really good for the stock banks because you kind of really don't want to interrupt that. And the other one was the really old fashioned geophysics, but the results of it weren't really that we can rely on them. So we are working with the um, University of Auckland and Canterbury, and they are help They are basically doing this with us. So at the moment, it's very manual. So we, if if this method is to be implemented, or if it is going to be something we are going to be using, we will have to look into how easier we would have to do. But this is all just a study, and our regional council is the first council who is actually doing something like this with the uh, researchers and engineers from the from the university. And it's kind of part of the level of service uh, project what we do. So now... Yeah, can we ask questions while we go, or would you like us just to run the uh, presentation? Well, for you, Joe, I'll let you have a question. Thank you. To what depth are you actually looking? So this, um, I'm not really sure, but I think it can go pretty much deep to the toe of the stop bank, mm -hmm. because that's where we really need to know. So um, the stop bank can be sometimes, I don't know, 2.53 meters high. So really we need, to, uh, we need to know the depth and how they do it is they, so for example, this one is 23 meters. They put the geophones every, um, every meter and then they um, hammer at the end of it is like a, a steel plate. Mm -hmm. That's get a signal down to the stop bank and collect the data. Sorry. So, um, yeah, as I said, I personally haven't, I think engineers or um, our group um, are doing this, so um, I just thought that I shared with you that it'll be quite good for you to know that. Um, this is really interesting, but the point about Jerry's thing is, is that it's not just a stop bank, you go down to because uh, the engineering of this, the stop bank itself might be absolutely secure, but the soil underneath it is porous, yeah. then the water under pressure will flow through and you get this effect called, as you were probably well aware, hydraulic pumping, which can erode the stop bank. So we need to not only know the stop bank, but the underground yeah. ground. So it's going to give us all those answers. Again. So I think what we were trying to point out just before the presentation started, that this is some recent technology that we've embraced. Just Great. like just like SkyTem, it allows us to see into the stock bank. It's a vast improvement on the older techniques where we're either doing a physical inspection only, or we had to destroy part of the stock bank to do a um, an inspection. The reason that is uh, relevant is you'll see further on in the presentation a key activity in this project is comprehensive understanding of our asset condition. So although previously we'd inspect them regularly physically. We, we didn't necessarily have a comprehensive understanding of the compaction of the material or the actual material because um, there's often not a lot of records of some of our older infrastructure. So we can probably bring this back in great detail at another session. Sure. Um, but but it's just really think, just a quick advertorial of... I just think now in terms of time, I just think you go, should go straight through the presentation and we'll take questions at the end. Otherwise we'll yeah. zoom down about 10 different rabbit holes. Yeah, because that's excellent stuff. Right, where you go. Just go on to the other one. That's it. Okay. So, um, right. And there's a screen um, there, Martina, so you can see. Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, this is for the Heritunga 
flood control scheme, level of services review. Um, this is just a kind of um, base, a map showing the red bits are the stop banks, and then the kind of blackish area is the, the area of the uh, collecting the rates and the protection. Um, so just a little bit of short history. Uh, so the level of services review, um, the first, I think the first, first consultation is like 2008, but the LTP 2012 and uh, 2022, um, there were three options put forward for the council to, um, to discuss, and um, then the consultation was taken on those three options. And a council decided after reviewing all three options, as a, the first one was keep the level of services and the asset as they are, with no investment. Um, the second option was <coughs> to increase level of services to 1,500. Or, and the third option is the same as the option two, but start the project in 2013, 2014 financial year. The outcome, as far as, as we know, or what we have found out, is that it was the council was supportive and decided on option two. So that means the upgrade to one uh, from one in a hundred to one to five hundred, with the start of the project in 2016 and 17. Um, again, the LTP 2015 and 2025 supported that, um, that project, and, um, but no specific or further consultation with red pairs have been undertaken. We have no records of it, or I have not found any. Again, the LTP 2018 and 2028, um, in the document facing the future, um, we said uh, that the project is going to be delivered within 10 years and 20 million being allocated for the budget, and we haven't done a specific consultation as of yet. That's that's just a little bit of history. This is just to show you um, what the region or the flooding affects, how the flooding affects the region if we don't have the flood protection. And, and this one is to kind of say the development of the flood protection and um, how productive, how many more productive land we have now. Uh, okay, so under the flood, pro flood protection scheme assets, um, those are the main assets. So stop banks, land, structures and culverts, edge protection and drainage, uh, drainage channel. Um, so this schematic is kind of just to show you what we're talking about when we are talking about flood protection. So it's a stop bank on the right and left bank, but not all the time you have a stop bank on both sides. Then you have a bar, bare area, which we normally plan with the willows or uh, with trees, which keep the flow in the channel or stop the velocities or slow down the velocities in the floods. And then there is the design channel. So that's basically um, the double bit where the river where the river normally um, normally stays if there is no flood. Um, this is just to again um, show you what it means when we are talking about flood. Um, so the first one is a normal flow, the banks fall, that's an annual flood. Five year flood is when you have, and we, we had that quite, quite few floods like that, when you have water from the kind of toe of the stub bank to toe of the stub bank. Um, so that one is um, progressively, progressively, progressively reaching, um, and those two are really we haven't experienced it for a long time, and it would be actually quite good, I think, if we have a bigger flood so we can <laughs> test us. Tomorrow? Well, we don't know. It may happen. Um, all right. So on those, uh, just again to show you what. So when we have a big flood, that's probably the flooding area we're looking at um, in different in different areas, one in a hundred year, year scenario. So this one is the Taradell scenario, that's Royce Hill scenario, and that's the Moto scenario. So if there's a one, if there's a flood in one in a hundred, 
this is kind of what we're expecting um, for each area, probably, a cure in May. Um, OK, so we have to also we talk about climate change um, all the time now. So climate change is one another factor. We have to look at the review of the level of services and um, add that into the mix. Um, climate change is causing higher, um, higher flood levels and more frequent floods. And more communities in, uh, are expanding assets um, with increased value than when schemes were first constructed. And scheme must also now provide integrated land use, enhance ecological and water quality outcomes while meeting the contemporary EV wider community aspirations. So that's just um, a little bit about what we have to um, add into our project. Um, so when we're looking at the level of services review, um, we have to look at how or what it means engineering wise. So we have stop banks, that's the main um, main assets um, which are kind of protecting or keeping the water in the channel. And so there are many options. This doesn't mean that we have to do just upgrade or work with the existing as assets. And I like to just kind of in next slides, uh, next slides just to show you what those options may be. Um, so the normal and traditional, probably, would be we would work with the existing assets. So we would make it higher, wider, and um, we just would upgrade. The, we will keep the existing assets and just add to it. So make it stronger. Um, the option two is double stop bank keep the existing assets, and then maybe a little bit further build another, another stop bank. Um, in Europe, they do quite a bit with this because between those stop banks, you, still have, you can still have productive land, and you can have parks. And in some location, even they build the houses, and they take the risk as also flooding. But that's just an option. Um, option three, um, to basically Move the, uh, move the room forever. So we would remove or we would build a new stop bank. We will um, take the soul of the old stop bank, use it for a build of the new stop bank, and make the rim river wider so the river has the room to move. And um, option four is something um, that can be, we can create wetlands, detention dams. We can um, allocate an area where we direct the flows when there is a big flood. Um, those are th those options are not the only options. There are there are other options. Other councils are doing their own work. So I think we should work with them and kind of see what what their op options may be. So um, the next slide is just to show you what the flood effect. But I am pretty sure <coughs> you all known and. But I thought that I'd bring a few slides on the flat effect. So this one is Bay of Plenty. We all know um, that it, that was quite big and affected a lot of people. And we really don't want to end up with nothing like this. Um, this is West Coast region. Um, this one is Coromandel in 2019 and Esk in 2018. Um, the Esk was a very fast flood. Um, just was intense, and it started. I've been involved in that flood, and started raining, and then a few hours later, the river was high, and it just was very, very fast. Um, so this one is. Um, I like to take you through the process of how we are planning to deliver this project. So. July 2018, um, that's where the LTP process happened, and we've been, um, again, approved to go ahead and deliver the project. Uh, flood frequency analysis, which are fed into hydrologic model that's been completed. Um, now we are working through asset condition assessment, which is the new assessment, um, and it will be giving us a better understanding of what are the current condition of the asset. Um, 
we really have to start thinking about communication and consultation plans. So we are working through how we're going to engage, who we're going to talk to first, and, uh, and um, steering group, setting up project teams. So that's all been already um, active. Um, we engaged the property group to look at the land matter investigation. So to look at the land which can be affected by this upgrade. If the upgrade is the way to do it, then we have to look, okay, so here's the bank, there is a land, who is going to be affected, what it means. Um, and then when we have all the hydraulics and engineering, we will be doing engineering optioneering. So we will look at where the steel bank can be upgraded, where it can be widened, what are the options. Uh, and when we're doing this, we will be engaging with other groups to get their views and ideas. Um, and then in July 2020, we will have to, we will come back here and present it what we have found out. And basically, um, just to see if, if we are on the track. Yeah, so there's a key decision point there once we've got concepts before we enter a um, more detailed design process that, that we have a level of comfort with the priorities and the, and the general concepts. Um, we will of course be coming back more regularly um, with just uh, information updates but there's a key um, decision gateway um, there. So, what are, what are the percentages? Is that how far down you are and say they, Those percentages are percentage complete. Complete. 10% of comms is complete. That's right. Yeah. So it's very obvious to everyone that we are very much at the initial stages of this project. So I think it's fair to say we've done more work uh, in the last six months than we have in the last eight years. And this is highlighting there's a whole lot of upfront modelling, assessment and other activities um, that occur before we sort of take out the bulldozers. Have you just finished the presentation before? Yep. It, this is your last slide, isn't it? Yes. Okay. So um, then we have prelim preliminary design. Uh, we have to do economic analysis on that because we have to kind of we have to look at the budget and we have to look at um, you know what is actually going to cost because um, I don't think that has been done and that's going to be a big factor on what we actually can do. Um, and then business case and a refined budget approval. When we have that, um, we have we go into the more detailed engineering and start allocating the phases of the of the whole work as what is the priority where we should be going as first uh, with the upgrade and um, kind of prioritization workshop for the construction phase. And also, I can't forget about land acquisition because that's going to be a big part of it. Um, and I think it's one of the risk we have to consider is that we have to look at if we are upgrading, if we are building, we need a land to do it. Um, and basically there is the construction, detail and construction phase. Um, we engage or we have a full-time project manager to working on this and um, that's pretty much his main focus to deliver the project with the time frame we have there, but they are not just him, but he's the driver and he kind of the main person to do this. Thank you very much. That's an excellent presentation. So, questions? Greg? Uh, just with the various options, is, is there any way the extraction of gravel contributes to or, or could be enhanced to <coughs> help lower some of the, the risks? So, the gravel is absolutely... Um, so, we do the gravel extraction because we want to um, increase the flood capacity and because that's, yeah, so the gravel extraction is part of it, yes. Another option as well as the various options on the stop banks is to actually s do more extraction yeah. to get out key yeah. areas. Yeah, so right. I, I would, I would put, probably caution that approach. Um, certainly um, one, of the, one of the slides there alluded that it, we have to look at these systems holistically. Mm -hmm. um, the sole purpose of the river is not to provide um, flood protection, so that we have a lot of um, biodiversity and environmental responsibilities. So I think some of those options are part of the solution, but we need to be able to, um, I guess, both the social licence and consentability of, of some of those options, and simply uh, deepening the entire channel um, 
or parts of the channel, I think, will be problematic. Um, Maybe, to, but to you've implement. predetermined it. That's an option. So we will look it up and just highlighting that it, 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 it comes with a, a number of major major risks. You wouldn't, you wouldn't yeah, you. want to go below the design level. <coughs> so we always work with the design levels in the river. And normally, Heretunga Plains is actually quite good because the gravel extraction is occurring there. But you wouldn't want to go below that. But and we, know we what that level is. And so we, we take surveys every three years and compare it how we are going. And, um, and that's how we allocate the gravel. Bob? Thank you. Look, just uh, very briefly, the land acquisition uh, is ringing an alarm bell for me. Not only is this work absolutely essential for adaptation, um, but it's possibly controversial. Um, and what we haven't gotten here, I don't think around your engineering optioneering and option evaluation is, is a, a, an active community consultation strategy option evaluation that's going to support whether it's a designation or a resource consent that you need for these things yeah. and ultimately the land acquisition through the Public Works Act. I don't know what those statutory mechanisms all are, but the option assessment and evaluation and the engagement around that is going to be absolutely critical to ensuring that this thing flies. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just respond to you on that. <clears throat> the legal powers are substantial. Are they good? Yeah. So I just want to say that. Substantial. Right. So, <clears throat> but the point that you make, uh, the way in which we manage and engage with this yeah. is going to be critical. Yes. That's agreed. But at the end of it, uh, the council has substantial powers. I'll move, Chair. No, Mr. Chair. Have you got a question? Where do you mind? No, no, I was moving, but you've got a question. Yes. Uh, if going back to your <coughs> slide uh, where you demonstrate the one in 100 year flood events and the impacts, can, would you mind going back to that slide? The yellow bits, the. The photo, I think the, the models of the, of the failure. You look at the Look at everything, the whole here are plains. That one, one before yeah. that one. That one. Uh, yeah. This one? That one there, yes. Um, just, just, have you got a one in 500 year scenario? Well, they're working on it at the moment. So that's been the hydraulic, um, that's the main, if we don't have that, really, we, we can't say what, what the effects are. So, and that's the key part of the work, which is currently already underway mm. with our modelers. Just, I, just speculating on what that could look like, does it, and does it, is it massively, um, encroaching beyond. All right, he's gone. Right, he's gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm like. Oh, well, he wants to know. Yeah. <laughs> 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 house is gone as well. <laughs> Sorry, I wouldn't like to comment on that until um, the model is. Let's, let's have the model. Have when, a when's that due? Yeah. So that is hopefully by end of this financial year, but yeah, let's just. Yeah. Sure, that becomes a key um, yes, instrument in the communication plan. Yes. Any yes. other questions? Councillor Graff? I'll move. Seconded. Seconded. Any, any comments? People yeah, want to speak? I do have a comment as the mover. Uh, I, I just want to thank you uh, for doing this. I think it's incredibly good, and um, especially you, Chris, uh, since you've come on board, you've really focused on uh, these stock banks. It's a pretty boring subject, but for people like but, but Jeriff and myself who have been through the break at Twyford, mm. it was quite devastating. And, um, you know, I mean, I'm quite interested in how that that happened uh, anecdotally it was the subsurface. So I'm really impressed with um, with the technology of examining our current stock banks. Uh, one thing for sure, we are going to have a uh, crisis uh, happen. It's going to rain, rain in the hills, and it's going to be a high tide, and our stock banks are going to come under pressure. There is nothing more certain and definite about that that is going to happen. So really appreciate, and I'm sure all the farmers. Because um, in the Heratonga catchment, 100% with you on this. Uh, we do need to get out and talk to them, but I know they'll be with you and Jeriff will want to comment on that further. But thanks for the work you've done. Jeriff? Yeah, it's actually, uh, I own the property that actually, uh, where it actually went through uh, in 82. So, <laughs> so a bit did of you do this before you bought it or after? <laughs> after, he bought it after. <laughs> I bought it cheap, but now I know why. <laughs> oh, great. He was working for when it came through. But anyway, it's, uh, I think the, 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 you know, I can't, 20 mil, uh, I think it has to be far more than that. Uh, yeah, it, it will, will be. be more than that.
you know, uh, you, you put it aside, but sure. you know, don't, don't, you know, it will be a lot, lot more, but so critical for all over and infrastructure. Uh, and, but it's the hinterland. It's like what we're going through right now, the ban is going to go on the narrow oil today, um, that we can't irrigate any longer those who are, are connected to it. But it's all what happens in the, in the catchment. So we actually, yes, building stock bank is very important, and I've alluded before in some comments I've made in previous presentations. It's actually what we do in the catchment is actually very important too. Forestation, trying to keep as much water in the land, it has got so many benefits. So don't forget that the two actually link together. Yes, sir. Well, Mr. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, following on from Jeff's observation that um, uh, we've got broader issues than simply putting stock banks in certain locations or building them up. Uh, for example, we've got the infrastructure around pumps, pump stations. Um, uh, I'd be interested to, to know in the next presentation, which I hope is soon, once you've done your one in 500 year analysis, um, what, what the consequences are for um, our other infrastructure, uh, and also um, adding to the list of mitigation that uh, is possible um, as to you know what other options are there higher up in the catchment, uh, what what else can be done, and uh, and putting those as options or uh, at least considerations in, in the next iteration. Any other speakers? I'll just make a couple, three points. <clears throat> uh, firstly, <laughs> it's really interesting. It's really interesting that Excellent. when they were going to build the railway into Hawke's Bay, central government said they were not going to put a cent in until the stop bank was built to control the Nauru River. It's there, it's still there. They identified it as a huge risk then and would not put a cent in until it was done. The second thing is that uh, the point about this presentation is some, several people mentioned the concerns of, in the earlier meetings of this uh, council that, about the stock banks. And the problem we've had is we haven't had any visibility really about what the program is. And so I'm really pleased about this because it gives us a clear timeline. You've given us visibility in a way we haven't had before, Chris and your team. I sort of thank you for that. A clear timeline and we can see what things are, we can now measure it, and you're going to report to us regularly. I think that's a really, really good thing. I think we all accept that there's uh, uh, the budget's going to be more than that. Now, the third point is, uh, in Southam, they've got floods in areas to an extent they have never seen before. Uh, so let's not think that whatever we've had before is where it's going to be again, uh, and we've got to be prepared. So on this plan you've got here, it's reasonably quick, but if you can do it quicker, I think we'll feel better about it. It's too late already. Yeah, so, just great stuff. So, all right. All those in favour of the resolution say aye. 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 Contrary, no. Carried. Okay, minor items. There were two minor items. I put a lot more, didn't I? What were they? Plastic. Oh, plastic. Now, unbeknownst to you people, I've been running around looking at how we do plastic disposal. Drill us. Sorry? Nothing. No. <laughs> Oh, it's drills, that's right. And while I went, and I have been to, uh, I have been to, <coughs> uh, to Wellington to go and see Flight, who do plastic and all those milk bottles we have, the clear plastic and so on, they do that and recycle it, but not all of it. What I was really concerned about is a lot of plastic we have, we don't just go to the landfill. Now, I have dug around, and there's one company in New Zealand which takes all other plastic, soft plastic, hard plastic, whatever, and they make it into things. But the point about this is that we aren't going to be able to deal with our plastic problem unless we reuse or use the repurposed plastic. So it's got to be a circle. So we have to go and do stuff with the plastic. Otherwise, it's simply just going to go to the landfill. This here, piece here is about uh, 200 milk bottles. Don't look like anchor milk bottles, but it's all been cooked up, sort sort of, and put a lot of carbon into it, and it's a fence post. Oh, I thought it was a pencil. Yes, it is, but these become fence posts. They, the company can do fence posts, bigger ones, square things, and I think we have to have, uh, we're like the, the council staff to think about, how we can make using recycled, repurposed things as part of what we do every day. So instead of using a timber post, where well we can, we should use a plastic one. And we should encourage people to get more involved in the circle, circular economy. If we don't do that, the way the, uh, 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 the landfill is just going to continue to get filled up more and more. So I'd like them to come along at some stage and give a presentation of what they do. I think we've got to get ourselves more into this sort of stuff.
um, it's going to fence off their streams to keep the cows out with plastic fence posts. Exactly. Yeah. All right, there's a fence post with 200 milk bottles in there. Isn't that fantastic? How does it compare to timber at this stage? Uh, better on almost every level. Uh, lasts longer. You nail it, screw it. Uh, it doesn't leach into the it doesn't leach into the soil with the, all the, the uh, chemicals are put into it. It's inert, and the other thing is that you can bump this with a tractor and it'll flex, whereas a fence post will break. Yeah. So these are better, just more expensive the outlet stuff, but they are actually better. I think we should be looking to how we can encourage our local people to use recycled materials much more often than what we're doing. The glass milk bottle. Cycle. Right? No. Thank you. I see it's great stuff. So all right. I'll talk to them better. And drillers. I thought maybe it was a drill. Drillers. Uh, I've had the approached by some drillers who'd like us to take us around and show us uh, what they do, the drilling, uh, a tour, and as a sort of alternative view or a complementary view to what we're doing with SkyTem. So would people be interested in going talking to them? If so, I'll actually send a note around and we'll organise something. We did that two years ago. I know we did, but there's a new council here, Rex. Which organisation? Oh, so, uh, Honours, Bailey's. Honours, ba Bailey's. Bailey's, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Be interested? Not, not the person that's been communicating to us by email. No, not that. Yeah, no. Guy. Okay. Yep, great. Thank goodness I'm not, I'm not going with coffee with that guy. <laughs> All right? Yeah. Okay, we'll be in touch with it, right? Yep. See you in a real meeting. Sorry? Declare the meeting closed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Well, cheers.